I'm capturing this moment so that we can have it to refer back to in the future. Much like all of life's moments, David. Back to the future. We have to record everything, even when we're making movies and are being recorded. Cool. Well, tonight we're going to talk about Val, a movie that is a compilation of videos and, and photos about Val Kilmer. And I'm not going to be doing this all night. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, I, uh, I'm excited to talk about this one. How about you? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been curious uh, as soon as it was announced. Um, it kind of crept up on me and kind of surprised me because I, I didn't really know that it was going to be that it was a thing, you know? Um, and then I, I forget, I want to say that maybe it debuted at Cannes. You're asking um, the wrong guy. Yeah, anyway, it was some film festival and it was getting kind of some buzz here and there. Uh, but you know how these things go, you want to kind of see it for yourself. Yeah. Um, and it seems like it's a joint venture between like A24 and Amazon, which is interesting. Yeah, it's because it's it's on Amazon right now for you know free Prime. if you've got Prime, yeah. um, and then it's an A twenty four production. Yeah, I was I was kind of surprised to see that logo pop up uh, as well. Yeah, and it's in theaters too right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're not busy watching the Suicide Squad, you're part of a large club. Frankly, uh, you can go see this movie. Um, but uh, I'm just saying that Suicide Squad didn't do very well at the box office. Uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> it's also true. This, you can also read the book. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. So this is, do you get the feeling that this book and this documentary are sort of in conjunction somehow? It's odd to have uh, a companion piece. And now that you've watched this hour and 45 minute movie, how does it stand up to a book that I assume is a few hundred pages long? Uh, 300 something. Oh, a little over 300. Um, obviously the book's gonna go into a lot more. Um, has more time. Um, and I think the movie is somewhat more of a, I, I think it could be a gateway to the book. Uh, like if you were really interested in what, uh, was presented in this documentary, I think this, this book, I'm, I'm your Huckleberry signed edition. Nice. Um, uh, this book is going to go into a lot more and he's actually a really good writer. I think, um, and uh, I think there's pro, there's not pros and cons, but there's there's pros to each uh, as you read this prose. The book um, is full of pros, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think the cool part, one of the cool things about the documentary is, is that it's narrated by his son um, and who is almost reading it like a young Val, uh, which really probably isn't that hard to do considering they're related um well it's it's an eerie thing because if you go into this documentary cold and you have no idea what's going on mm -hmm. you might just think oh it's val kilmer reading about his life but if you know what happened with him getting it was throat cancer yeah and then he had you know surgery done and you know now he's got like a little breathing tube that he has yeah. to press and and release whenever he wants to speak and it's that very kind of mechanical voice you might wonder, how am I listening to what I'm listening to? Because he's speaking in the present tense about his life, and that should be impossible. Yeah. So when you find out, and you know, yeah, okay, so this is a spoiler for those who haven't watched the documentary, but you mm -hmm. see that it's his son, Jack, in a recording booth. And like, oh, that's, that's really sweet. And it's also cool because they do sound so much alike mm -hmm. that throughout the rest of the documentary, you almost forget that it, because it is all told in first person, you forget that it's not him telling the story. So you really get that impression that it is his mind relaying that information. And he kind of talks about that in the film, like when you're debil debilitated in that way, people aren't quite sure if it's still all you in there that had that same voice and mind. And it really is. Right. I mean, you could tell in his present state, he gets, uh, I wouldn't say easily exhausted, but, you know, he gets probably more fatigued than most um, because it's just taxing on his body. Um, he, but he's still, you, he's still got the twinkle in his eye and he's still got uh, this kind of zeal to be creative and artistic. Um, and so it was really cool to see 
I think both his kids, primarily Jack, his son, um, partake in, in, in help, you know, create this documentary. Um, I'm sure he, you know, Val wrote what, you know, Jack is reading. Um, and I'm sure, I, I, I don't know the whole story behind the documentary or how these co-directors um, got involved, but I'm sure a lot of this stemmed from him writing his autobiography and said, you know, like I could, I have all this footage. He had thousands of footage from, you know, family, uh, fam from family footage from an early age to all the videos he took on set, uh, not just on set, but also on in the plays that he was in, um, that something can be done with all this stuff. And, and I, I want to believe that him writing the book was kind of the impetus for all this. Well, let's talk about that footage because at one point we follow him to what looks to be a warehouse with mm -hmm. pallets yeah. of recorded material. I don't know if there's a, an Oscar available <laughs> for sheer effort in putting together a documentary, but it was, it was unbelievable. I mean, it looked like where the Ark of the Covenant should be in there. I don't yeah. know how they got everything compressed down to an hour 45, which you're right. This is a great, almost trailer for the book to get more into the stories and to mm -hmm. what I assume is more information on some of the movies that kind of skipped over like right. you know, real genius. I will take issue with the fact that, and I understand why he did it, but he referred to top secret as fluff. We'll talk about uh, that. <laughs> but you know, it's, it, I should mention, I don't know if we actually have mentioned his full name, Val Kilmer. We're talking about Val as the, <laughs> uh, the eponymous Val. <laughs> the other Batman, the Jim Morrison, the Iceman, the, yeah. Yes, the... Uh, the Doc the guy, I was going to say the guy from Dr. Moreau. Now, the other <laughs> great thing about watching this uh, movie is it reminded me of just how uh, big the gaps are in my Val Kilmer filmography knowledge. I've never seen Tombstone. Get uh, out of here! I, I shall. I'm packing up Sorry, I, right now. I, I hate to be that guy, and I hate when people respond that way, but wow. No, and that's the thing, is I know you're a big fan of that movie, and, mm -hmm. um, and I think you're the person who repopularized in my mind the phrase i'm your huckleberry because i think i'd heard that when the movie came out and now and yeah you, you say that to me sometimes yep, yep, but yep. i here's the thing uh it's, it's turning 30 in two years i think we're going to talk about it you and me let's do it if we're still alive in two years we can that's, do it that's true we have to survive <laughs> this whole thing in order to talk about tombstone you know it'd be really interesting and this is a sidebar but you get val kilmer this, on no well there'd be maybe we could uh there's that whole thing in the 90s where they were making two of everything. Right. So that that was the year that Tombstone came out, like in the beginning of the year. And then uh, Wyatt Earp came out. The Costner one. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And then I, there was the two insect movies, Bugs Life and Ants, A-N-T-Z, I think. Yeah. And then there were the two disaster movies. Well, there's a bunch of them. There's the Volcano and then yeah dante's peak and then there was the deep impact and uh uh uh, uh i guess you could say armageddon maybe armageddon yeah that's right yeah. Yeah. yeah same year same year so and then in the 90s they were just doing all that like oh you're doing this so we'll, we'll do one too but uh it's 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 kind of uh the the comic book movie rivalry has uh has taken place kind of that thing. yeah 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 but uh, yeah so yeah, so we'll talk about Tombstone in a couple of years. Um, also, you know, The Doors. I, I've never seen The Doors. Um, I've never seen it all the way through, but I have it on blue. Well, we should talk about that because that turned be 30 cool. this year. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I think, you know, what? I think I started watching The Doors because I liked the idea of Oliver Stone making a Jim Morrison movie, but I was also 13 when it came out, so I was <laughs> not ready at all to watch that movie. Yeah, it's pretty trippy. Um, um, I was ready to watch... This movie, direct, co-directed by Ting Pu and Leo Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure how much... It's it's odd when you're talking about a movie like this, how much of it was directed. Because, you know, it's there's so much footage that Val Kilmer shot himself of him, you know, just talking to the camera or him shooting his, you know, filming his kids and, you know, friends and family and business sure. stuff. And then sometimes you'll get those intimate shots of like him at that convention in London, you know, that whole stretch. I imagine that was filmed by the film crew, but it's so seamless in terms of a narrative that there's not really a break. There's the convention in London. 
there's also the Comic Con, and then there's also that like Texas screening of Tombstone, yeah. where he's signing stuff. Um, I see. I, I didn't do my homework, but I wish that you know. I don't know if it's even that much written about the making of this movie because it's like at some point was his family like like Jack following him on some of these you know, signing ventures, uh, you know, con appearances, or was it the co-directors or one of the directors or the cinematographer involved, you know, shooting him? Um, Because there's that whole scene where he was kind of just exhausted at Comic-Con and wanted to take a break. And instead of having everybody see him exit, you know, they just covered him up with a blanket and wheelchair and and wheeled him out. Um, Well, that was an interesting not reveal because it wasn't really revealed. It was more like I noticed how that setup was as the scene played out Mm -hmm. because there's the signing table for those who have been to conventions, you know, Mm -hmm. exactly what we're Mm -hmm. talking about for those who don't, this might be some new information like kind of a long table where you've got, you know, different handlers to, you know, take the money or make sure the autograph pen is working Mm -hmm. to slide the glossy or the photo over to the the celebrity celebrity signs. It does like as, Hey, how are you doing? Kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Same kind of a deal, a very long queue uh, in London, because I think at that point it was pretty rare to see Val Kilmer doing any kind of like fan circuit. He kind of gets into that in this movie. But at one point he does get exhausted and he's like, I need to take a break. I need to lie down. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm thinking, okay, they're just going to go back to the hotel room. The couch that he lies down on is right behind the table in full view of everyone. They don't even, they don't have like a curtain or anything to pull back for privacy. I don't think it's in full view of everyone. I think it was one of those like lined kiosks where you still have these walls walled partitions so you stop there and then you go like the, there's somebody who stops the line and lets them in one by one and then you you walk into like kind of this walled off area and that's where that table is well no that's so there's that, that i understand what you're talking about that was the private signing area yeah but the ta- the couch was like right behind the table oh, sure there was like but, two, but there, was there like were two no feet. more there are no more like guests but then, so they kick, like, yeah, the, the I, I camera they, angle, they, they, they might have. I, yeah. I assume that there were still people in that private area. They yeah. probably did clear it out a little I bit. I think they capped it off and they probably just stopped it right there and nobody else is in the area. Um, but yeah, and even like he motioned that he wanted to like spit up. Um, oh, and, and, they th- brought yeah. over, and they brought over that garbage can. It's like, oh man. Yeah. So there's definitely moments like that where you really feel sorry for, they really. I don't know if I feel sorry you really feel for the guy yeah. um and what he's enduring and, and going through and he even kind of admits that some of this you know these signing ventures are kind of humiliating and he, he makes sure he says you know not not to knock any of the other actors who are doing this but for me this is not what i was expecting expecting i would be doing I, i'm sure that's <laughs> that's how a lot of you know former pro wrestlers and actors feel but um it's where the money is um and it's how you pay off debts uh, a lot of times if you're a pop culture figure um oh yeah it reminded me of you know the reason alan moore who wrote watchmen and swamp thing and you know everything else cool in mm-hmm. comics uh he stopped doing conventions i think back in the, the 80s or maybe it was the early 90s because yeah. he had he was at a convention and in his hotel that night he had a dream of just like hands coming out and, and ripping him up t- to pieces and he said that's it no more no more fan yeah. interactions uh in that capacity but what really drove that home to me because you and i both have done you know we're, mm-hmm. we're fanboys you know we'll go to places get stuff signed you know stand in those lines but what was interesting and i've seen this but it's not until you see it in montage that you realize just how monotonous it has to be for the talent because he's signing all of these top gun photos and it's like and batman and batman but the top gun one specifically it's like can you write uh i'll be your wingman i'm sorry can you put your your wingman will you sign this yeah anytime yeah and it, it's Oof. this goes on for like a good minute and then you realize that's you got to multiply that over hundreds of minutes over a weekend and it's just got to be crazy yeah you need somebody to come up and bring like some kind of rare you know kill me again with a star and his wife you know with his wife um some kind of rare movie that he's like oh you know it's like kill bring, me again what is this movie k- kill me again yeah is it is it just with one l like kilmer like <laughs> <laughs> that would be good <laughs> no, I forget when Kill Me Again came out. Uh, not to say that I saw it, but I just remember that there were certain movies that 
there was a couple movies. Obviously, he it was introduced to his wife uh, in London theater, but then they co-starred in, in Ron Howard's Willow. Um, but I do recall, I think it was a late 80s, early 90s, um, where he was also in another movie with, um, yeah, Kill Me Again came out right after Willow. Um, and it was uh, directed by John Dahl, who also did, I think, The Last Seduction, yeah, mm. and Red, Red Rock West. Um, so it was the, kind of like those noir, neo-noir movies that uh, John Dahl was doing at the time. Um, so I'll have to look that up. I always wanted to see it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, that, that whole thing with, uh, with his wife, I mean, you, you might think just the selling point of this movie is, oh, it's Val Kilmer and it's personal movies and you get to see, you know, stuff from the set of Top Gun and Batman. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's a very small part of the movie, but what you really get into is his relationship with his family, you know, mm-hmm. not only with his ex-wife now, not only with his kids, but with his family growing up, the complicated relationship he had with his father, the the haunting memory of his younger brother's uh tragic death which you realize by the time this movie is over that so got to him and it never he he was never really able to to exercise that no and uh, the poor kid died at age 15 in the family like outdoor jacuzzi there yeah Uh, i think under the watch of his father Mm -hmm. um yeah and it it's it's funny because i i knew that he lived as an adult, he would he lived in New Mexico with Joanne Wally Kilmer, uh, or just Wally now, um, and uh, but I also knew he grew up in around L.A. So that it, the movie touches on this a little bit in the beginning is that uh, I think uh, is it is it Chatsworth or I forget what town it's in. I'm just looking at books, but um, so his father was kind of like a real estate guy. Um, and he, he lived not too far from Roy Rogers and they go into this, uh, Roy Rogers estate and they go into this in the book where, you know, his father was, you're really just trying to be this kind of real estate baron in Los Angeles and in the Los Angeles area, this kind of like the Valley and it never really took off. Um, but at one point he did purchase uh, the Roy Rogers kind of like farm and estate that they that was being sold down the street. And so that's where him and his younger brother um, would make all these, you know, home movies and, you know, have great, great time. It, it, it seems like, um, and it, his brother was the younger brother, right? Yeah, I Wesley. Think so, I think Wesley, yeah. So he was the younger one. And it seems like he was kind of like the more of the director and, and also an actor, but I think like Val was definitely getting more into acting, even from an early age, they show like a footage of him probably in like maybe sixth grade in a stage production of the mouse that roared. Um, and, uh, you know, even then he's doing some, you know, crazy accent and stuff. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think like to me, uh, my first introduction to Val Kilmer was Top Secret. And Top Secret is a, is a dear film to my heart because I remember seeing it with, uh, there was this uncle of mine who, all right, technically wasn't an uncle, but we just called him uncle, but he was visiting from California and he was really good with kids because he was like a high school counselor. And so I was, you know, probably a preteen um, and he's like, hey, you want to go to the movies? And he's like, you pick it. And I, I, by that time I was watching Siskel and Ebert and stuff and I forget what they thought of it, but I just saw clips of it and I'm like, I gotta go see this, you know? And it's just the poster with like the cow and everything. And, and we were the loudest, probably the loudest people in that small theater in the Northwest suburbs. And we were just laughing so hard. And it was so great to be able to connect to a guy who, you know, was really interested in me watching this movie and it was just so hilarious to me and I remember getting the soundtrack I remember like really impressed that like Val Kilmer had this screen presence and the way he delivered the dialogue was like really like kind of rat-a-tat-tat a lot of times and uh his physical presence and his singing ability 
um, I was just like, I want to see everything this guy's in. And so, yeah, to hear him say that it was just fluff and understand he, this is an actor who went to Juilliard and, and who's trained in Shakespeare and, you know, Chekhov and all this stuff. It's like, okay, but it is your big, huge Hollywood break. I mean, maybe not huge, but your big Hollywood break intro into movies. I mean, you seemed really into it. So just for this documentary, just call it fluff and then move on. Come on. Well, that's the that's the thing. I mean, because that was wasn't that a Zucker Abrams mm -hmm. uh, production? Yeah, you know, along the, folks the lines did, of the airplane airplane, movies. right? Yeah. If that movie had really landed, I mean, Top Secret is a cult film now, mm -hmm. but it didn't do very well, you know, when yeah. it came out. But I think if it had been another airplane, a huge smash, he would have totally owned that, uh, you know. But and that's the you do mention the whole actually training. And he does talk about craft a lot during the course of this documentary. Mm -hmm. um, but you also see the silliness that he invests not only in his characters, but in his personal life. He's a goofball. Kinda, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't quite, when he talks about, I, you know, if you ask me, I still can't explain to you what the movie is about. It's like, well, yeah, that's kind of the point. That's the joke. It's, but, it's like, there is a disconnect there. Like, why doesn't this guy get that movie? It's like, I think he's embarrassed to talk about it in a way. I don't know why um because i mean he's incredible in it and he did explain what it's about i mean he said it's, it's like a right it's a rock musical war it's a you know a parody of rock musicals and war films that's all you need to know yeah you know i mean <laughs> with a great cameo by omar sharif but i mean and peter uh, cushing I, yes oh that's right uh but uh yeah i mean you knew what it you knew what you were doing and you knew what it was about and you were great in it and i just man come on um that, that feels it and i don't know if they touch on this in the book at all but it feels like the you know that exuberance with which he attacked his first big project and like went all in on it when it didn't perform i have a feeling there are people saying okay you're gonna go do top gun or real genius you're gonna get right. away from the silly stuff that was cute but it's not really it's not that good you know that but sounded it, like other people talking into his brain yeah, and it's funny when I think about it now, um, it just kind of dawned on me. It's like, out of all the movies that are touched on, and by touched on, I mean, it's like, we're not really going into a whole lot of detail in most of these roles, but I, I'm i sitting here wondering, like, well, what role does he think that he really liked? I mean, obviously, Jim Morrison. Yeah. Because that's the one he studied the most um and and really for a whole year got into and it's probably one of it's probably the the uh start of his the uh, uh, dis uh, dissolving of his marriage um but you know i mean i would say maybe jim morrison doc holiday and his role as you know chris in heat are the ones that he really liked uh but everything else is just kind of like and then I did this, and this is the movie I met my wife in, and you know, and even like the whole, you could tell he was having fun with Top Gun, and I think he really liked Tony Scott, and the director, and I loved seeing the, you know, kind of like the home movie behind the scenes video footage of what was going on at Top Gun. Um, I'm glad he didn't have, he's, he doesn't have any ill will towards Tom Cruise or anything um but it was interesting to see like it was the start of him like doing this whole method acting where he stays in character and he stays away from maverick and goose and hangs out yeah, with spider in hollywood yeah right um and it really makes me interested in what type of role or cameo he's going to have in the, the sequel um because he's in it but a lot of these other actors like uh viper and hollywood and all these other characters, they're all recast. Like Rick Rasevich is not in Top Gun Maverick. And, you know, um, like like Ed Harris and John Hamm are recast as some of these uh, characters. And it's just like, okay, they're just counting on people not remembering. <laughs> and it's like, because that's the thing is like, we, I mean, I would love to see Tim Robbins revisit that role, even if it's a small one. You know, it's like, that's the cool thing about these kind of legacy sequels if you want to call them that well especially with you know no disrespect but the way val kilmer is now mm -hmm. how are they going to pull that off i mean is I it is it going to be like iceman got an something accident happened? right or 
is it going to be like a an Independence Day resurgence situation where Will Smith was in the movie because they had like a portrait of him hanging on the wall? <laughs> oh no, that would be bad. I hope they don't do that because you know he is making movies. You know he he is making movies. There's a couple movies that I that I saw clips of him in recently where I don't think he he, he has. It's almost I would say more so of like a present uh, a present a presence uh and that's like he doesn't have like so many lines like there's this movie that he was in that came out earlier this year called the birthday cake uh with um william fichter uh ewan mcgregor uh lorraine bracco emery cohen um kind of like a kind of like a gangster movie mm. and he plays uncle angelo this mysterious figure and and now i didn't see the movie i just saw the trailer but you could tell he just is a presence and they talk about him a lot and I don't know how many lines he has. So I'm glad he's at least still doing stuff. Um, but it is, if you go, if you didn't know anything about Val Kilmer, you didn't read or see anything about what was happening in his life for the past, like say 10 years. Um, you didn't know his fight with, you know, cancer and his, what the radiation kind of left him with. Um, this you know hole in his throat and he has to kind of like put his finger there in order to speak and it's kind of like this really gravelly low deep voice um, you would be surprised okay um, and I think you could tell that over the years he didn't really want to come out and just say here's what's going on with me um, because there was a lot of rumors and there's a lot of and and he probably just didn't want to like maybe he wasn't ready to just put it out there. And this, that's what this movie is about um, is I think it really does put it out there. And he is kind of in control somewhat of where this movie is going because the, the, besides the fountain, I wouldn't say found footage stuff, but, but besides the archive footage um, there is, you know, up-to-date footage of him like in his studio working on art painting he's throughout the movie the movie he's making this like collage of the different topics the documentary is going to cover um those books those collage books reminded yeah. me of you've seen Yodorowsky's dune right yeah, yeah yeah that's what it reminded me of too i and since i saw that movie at the lake street screening room i've wanted one of those scrapbooks not actually the original, I understand, but someone out there has got to just recreate these things in a giant coffee table edition so we can flip through them because they're art pieces onto themselves. That would be cool. Uh, they really are. I mean, you see him not just making these kind of creative collages, but um, he uh, later in the movie, he talks about how he kind of got this studio space. I assume it's in where he near where he lives in New Mexico. And it's become this whole thing like where it's an art gallery it's also a an actor's studio um or young actors um or i guess actors of any age can take classes and um it's something that he's cultivating you know but it's also his studio area where he does paintings and stuff and uh particularly after his cancer treatment he really dove into that uh not right away because he does touch on the fact that there is this dark period and I wish the movie would have gone into that a little bit more about, you know, what, what was the dark period like, you know, because I think that's something that a lot of people could relate to. Um, it would have been nice to just see like, you know, kind of, obviously it was getting in, getting back into a creative uh, kind of mindset uh, helped him, but what was that like? Who, who was in his life? helping him you know is that covered in the book it, it is yeah there's again there's a lot more covered in the book um because i i understand why they might leave something like that out i don't know how terribly dramatic it would be um especially because i imagine a lot of that has to do with stuff that's going on in his mind that you just can't physically express um yeah i do you know, this movie has its peaks and its valleys, not in terms of quality, but in terms of, you know, where he is as a yeah. person. Uh, you know, he has a lot of obstacles put in front of his life, but, you know, his perseverance, I think, 
he feels if I had to armchair psychoanalyze him, I think he feels like he owes something to his dead brother who could not have the career that he was, you know, kind of granted. So he sees a lot of positivity and a lot of opportunities, sees some negativity in those opportunities. And we'll get to Dr. Moreau in a, in a minute. Yeah. Um, but the whole thing about that artist kind of uh, studio and atmosphere, mm-hmm. not to give too much away because we're, I want people to have some kind of surprise when they watch this documentary, but that is him take rebuilding something from the ashes of a disaster, because that was a dream that he had had for a long time that he was on his way to realizing that, you know, it just for a very significant and dark reason, he wasn't able to achieve on the scale that he wanted to. Yeah. But later he was able to make a micro version of it. So yeah, it's just, it, I'm almost convinced that at some point there's going to be some kind of a treatment and he gets his, <laughs> he gets his voice back and comes back to the screen as you know, the presence that he once was watching this movie. I get the feeling that if anybody could you know pull that off cosmically, it'd be him. It's a matter of, it's almost like a matter of faith because he does talk about religion and spirituality mm-hmm. throughout the film. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that would be great. Um, with a movie like this, especially with his involvement, you do kind of run the risk of kind of like self-praise. Um, and I, I think, especially if you go in knowing somewhat of his reputation on set and stuff and working with actors and direct other actors and directors, you kind of, at least for me, you kind of approach it with a little bit of, okay, what kind of angle are we going to have here? You know, mm-hmm. is this going to be like uh, um, just how how immensely talented I am kind of thing and blah, blah, blah. I don't think it's necessarily that. I mean, you definitely see, like you said, the kind of peaks and valleys, the highs and lows. Um, I think we see a little bit of the difficulty when we get to, definitely when we get to the island of Dr. Moreau. Now that movie has its own documentary. (laughs) <laughs> yeah um yeah um uh, and Which I, I have not i've that's another one i've not i seen haven't seen either have you seen the film the yeah the, okay because i i, saw I, I stayed films. away from it because i heard i heard it was terrible but i now i'm thinking it's the kind of terrible that needs to be seen to be no, believed and then watch the documentary yeah it's definitely worth trying out and checking out and uh, i haven't i've only seen clips of the documentary um I think the footage that we see and it's really weird because you're only getting his perspective of what went down. Um, well, you're, you're getting, you're getting David Thewlis and, you know, to a certain yeah. extent, Mar- Marlon Brando, <laughs> it, it definitely is his, his perspective because he's the one wielding the camera. Yeah. And you kind of understand what they're dealing with, with Frankenheimer because Kilmer is fair to the production and to Frankenheimer in a certain extent, because he talks about how the first director quit Frankenheimer was brought on behind schedule and he had mm-hmm. a mess of, you know, a mess to clean up, but then he starts attacking him for not giving the actors, you know, clear direction, yeah. motivation, room to play that kind of stuff. So you really have to hold on to that thread while you're watching it. And while Kilmer is like complaining to David Thewlis about like, did he talk to you? He hasn't given us, us any instruction. I'm not leaving here and I'm not, I'm not putting my camera down until we're officially rehearsing. He's grandstanding. Yeah. I'm thinking about Frankenheimer. I'm like, it may be true that he's not giving the actors what they want, but it also may be true that he's got studio heads saying, you know, you've got until tomorrow to get these 17 shots down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's your head. <laughs> at that point, I felt I felt a little bit more for Frankenheimer than I did Kilmer, because right. as an actor, you should be. And this isn't his first film. He's been around, but he's also been around long enough for his ego to build, you know, and and, you know, this is a guy who basically, you know, worked with Oliver Stone to just totally, you know, encompass the movie The Doors with his character, Jim Morrison. So he had kind of like, you know, full full reign to be that character in this movie it, he's not even uh, i mean he's not even really a main character um and i understand your director gets fired and then this veteran comes in john frankenheimer that, that stuff happens 
and it's not it's not comfortable but as an actor you should be somewhat flexible to just you know kind of back up and go with it to get switch gears you know because it's still bottom line it's still a job and it sometimes it may not turn out to be the job that you thought it was going to be uh but mm. it's it's tough because it's not like it's not like being on a construction site where they're like, okay, now you've got to pick up and you know move right. one town over and still lay pipe or whatever. You have to embody a character and mm -hmm. you know be in a scene and be present with other actors working off each other. I also wonder how much because he idolized Brando, you know, going oh, back yeah. to his childhood. And now he's For working sure. with him. I almost feel like he was sort of protective of that because there's a whole scene where there was a another actor named norm that norm. we find out who is dressed up in the brando the full mm. outfit and kind of trotted out for i guess you know medium and far away show up. Yeah. right because he, they had to get the movie done mm -hmm. but then kilmer and thulis are like who's that guy it's not yeah. marlon brando marlon's over in his trailer who's you know what's your name right. norm oh hi norm nice to meet you they're yeah. kind of being dicks about it all right but it it's fascinating about this documentary is it really does give you everything and make you sit down and figure out how do you feel about this yeah um and again with vel taking kind of charge of what he's working with the directors yes but it still feels very much like this is the way vel wants this documentary to go uh because it's not like they're there's no talking heads really in this documentary which is great i welcome yeah. that it's, yeah it's very different i mean but it would be interesting to hear from you know, David Thewlis. Well, working with Val on that set was very taxing, or something. You know, uh, just just to have that other perspective. But then again, that's what the uh, Dr. Moreau uh, documentary is for, I guess. Um, well, it's, it, it's funny because that the sense of Kilmer as an actor, in terms of his reputation, doesn't come into the film until much later on. It's almost yeah. jarring when you start, because the way he talks about acting and his love of it from, from an early age and uh, you know taking on these challenges, mm -hmm. you really kind of get endeared to him in his process. But then all of a sudden, out of the blue, it's like people you know, on set say Val Kilmer was very difficult to work with. And you got Robert Downey Jr. popping up and saying, you know, maybe he is difficult, but you know, who isn't? I'm like, well, where did all this come from? Yeah. And, and you're not sure exactly if it came, you know, if that was, you know, if it was, was it post Willow, you know, um, I, I don't know, you know, Top Gun, you know, much of those characters were kind of like thinly realized. So he brought a lot more to that character. I love um, the backstory that he that yeah. first of all he came up with a backstory for Iceman, but it was also mm -hmm. very simple. But yeah, it's it's kind of like the the backstory to Iceman and the soap opera acting tidbit that he gave for Batman for Forever. Batman. I'm mm -hmm. never going to be able to watch either of those movies the same way again. Yeah, yeah. Or I'm just surprised you're going to watch Batman Forever again. But uh... I, this movie, <laughs> this movie made me want to go watch it because yeah. the, the, he is narrating, or you know, I guess Jack's reading yeah. the narration mm -hmm. uh, and you see clips of what they're talking about in terms of the way Kilmer had to approach acting because you really get a sense of what it's like to be in that suit you really get a sense that it's not Val Kilmer it's Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones getting to play mm -hmm. with these characters Kilmer just looks good in the suit and he's placed places like an action figure right and that's what I think a lot of people especially you know comic book fans had realized especially with the schumacher films is that like yeah it's called batman but they're not really delving too much into who this character is i mean it's always about the villains unfortunately so um you know it wasn't even really until the christopher nolan movies where we kind of you know delve into a little bit more about bruce wayne but even then a lot of times the villains were kind of overshadowing i get it but there needs to be this kind of balance and you know, Batman's supposed to be the greatest detective. Uh, do we see him do any detective de de detecting in this Batman Forever? Not really. Hey, he reads that Riddler <laughs> card and he solves it in like five <laughs> seconds. That's that's hard work. There's a lot of problems with that movie, but I always maintain that Kilmer was a really good Batman and just not a really good Bruce Wayne. <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know, it's I. It comes to, back to Schumacher for me because yeah. I think. 
he could have been a good Bruce Wayne. I think he had the look. I think he mm. had that kind of hauntedness to him. But then, you know, it just gets into all this goofy nonsense with, you know, Chase Meridian and all that. But yeah. yeah. And Chris O'Donnell was way too old um, oh, for Robin. But um, yeah, it's it's funny. I like the part he was talking about how he when he got the call from his agent he was in africa just exiting like a bat cave uh you know exploring a bat cave and then he gets this and who doesn't want to be like you said who doesn't want to be batman when they were a kid and it was like of course i said yes um and just realizing especially at that point what the bat costume was like you know you couldn't really hear too well you couldn't really move too well um you know uh, it's it's a big step you know, a big, uh, big step, a big leap between that costume and the, the Christopher Nolan Batman costumes, um, even the Affleck. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely felt for him as an actor, but, you know, at the same time, dude, you're Batman. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I understand why he wouldn't want to do another one. Um, and that it's around the time where he was offered the saint. I well, didn't yeah, realize. He... Yeah, I didn't realize at the time that he went from like Batman forever right into Michael Mann's heat which I'm sure was wonderful for him. Yeah. Well, he said the, the next, it was like the next day, like he wrapped Batman and then he was off to, to LA to do heat. Um, so the scenes that they showed, you know, with he's, you know, Christian hairless is all like strung out looking and sweaty and right. on the, on death's door. I, I don't, they probably didn't have to do any makeup. They're just like, yeah, I just got back from doing Batman. Um, mm -hmm. One little tidbit I thought was cool was uh, they showed Jack as a young boy in a toy Batmobile like you'd see at the at the grocery store, like the, you know, it's you put the quarter in and he had one of those. They sent one to his house. <laughs> so funny. So funny. I love this scene later on. And I, I don't know, I, I guess that that scene later on when at, at the, in present day where both Val and Jack are dressed up as Batman and Robin was hilarious. I loved it. Um, and I just love that. Uh, I think what I appreciated the most about this document documentary is, is seeing his relationship with his kids and how, you know, they are involved in his life. And he's involved in their lives. Maybe, you know, it seemed like even in the footage, like he was always really trying to make an effort as a father and really trying to be involved and be, you know, fun and creative and goofy. Um, so it was, you know, cool to see that. Um, well, yeah. going back to something you had mentioned um, before about stuff the movie kind of left out, that's where, you know, it's a relationship with the kids. It's it's nice. It's sweet. You know, it's very moving. Mm -hmm. But it is, we get so much about his life that I started wondering, what was it like growing up, you know, with your dad being batman and an actor constantly going away and when he comes back he's preparing for his next role he's in character the marriage is falling apart what does mom think of this you know because joanne while he is in the movie kind of briefly towards the end yeah um, for a for a funeral scene which we don't need to go go into but there isn't really a sense of outside of things are great now we're really involved with each other now yeah like he lives and like this is it kind of lost me for like 10 seconds where they do this cutesy bit of you know i'm val is like i'm coming to pick you up he's talking to his daughter mercedes she and she's like okay dad i'll see you soon when you come and get me and they both walk downstairs and they like live next door to each other in this you know they share a, yeah sure yeah they, they share a flat i'm like but i'm bumped yeah yeah it That's is cute. it's thematically cute like the home movies he made with his brother mm -hmm. so i guess it works in that way but for me it just kind of ripped it was just a big old thing of artifice onto something that had, up to that point felt pretty real yeah and i do wonder i mean it must have been tough especially considering how he really dove into his roles and how he disappears into these characters i mean he was like i mentioned he was mentioning that for a year, whole year, he was Jim Morrison. I, I couldn't even live with that. Uh, but I mean, he, nonstop hearing and watching The Doors. Um, oof. But yeah, it must have been tough. And uh, I guess, like I said, you know, because, you know, Val has such a, a handle on this documentary, I'm sure they didn't want to get all into it. Um, I think for me, the, 
what's great about this movie is it, it definitely does he is showing a lot of vulnerability and he is showing who he really is right now. Uh, but I also like that balance of like, here's who I, here's who I've been that you may not know, you know, like you may only know me for my roles, but here's who I, I've been behind the scenes. Um, here's what I've been passionate about. Um, and you, like you said, you, it shows his goofiness and everything, but so it is kind of cool to see, uh, the then and now, uh, but well, you know, like you kind of hinted at, is I, I am wondering about. Okay, we don't get too dark in some of the, the the things that he has regrets about, or so. You know, the, that's obviously not. We, we don't navigate through that, uh, but yeah. Well, I mean, for as much as we don't get, we do get a lot of insight, and it's something that. I mean, I've always liked Val Kilmer. I thought he's taken interesting mm -hmm. roles. And like I yeah. said, I haven't seen everything he's done. But what I was really surprised by, this is going to sound mean, but, you know, he, especially back in his heyday, he was like a golden god, like one of the, the most the attractive hunky. men yeah. to ever be in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he played a lot of, especially early on, kind of pretty boys, you know, from top secret to, you know, being, you know, Iceman in mm -hmm. Top Gun to, you know, literally just playing Batman. Uh, you don't necessarily get the feeling that there's a whole lot there. So to hear him talking about, you know, his stage craft and what he, you know, the way he prepares for roles, the way he mm -hmm. really considers acting a life's pursuit and like he's trying to get to a greater truth. And he talks about all the people he's read and the different theories on mm -hmm. performance. You realize, my God, this guy is, I mean, genius isn't a, isn't the word, but he's a crafts a craftsman. He's yeah. He happens to have been given these amazing, you know, good looks and thrust into the Hollywood limelight. But you can tell he would almost give that all up for the perfect acting opportunity. Oh, for sure. You know, and you know, it was cool to see, you know, how he approaches roles. It was cool to see some of that like footage of him at Juilliard on stage. I really like that um, footage of him. I forget what play it was that he was co-starring with Kevin Bacon and uh, Sean Penn. And <laughs> I was like, wow. Uh, and I think the, the novelty of that is that there's some very fun and funny uh, footage from backstage. But he touches on something that, you know, we always hear that, like, you know, there's no small roles, only small actors. But what happens to him in that play is, as I think maybe one of the, one of many kind of pivotal moments for him as an actor is like, you need to make a decision here, you know, and I'm not going to say it's, it's as pivotal a moment in his life as say the death of his brother. But I think that that, what happened to him, I get the feeling that what happened to him in that, play really kind of uh you know developed a, a hopefully developed a little bit of a thicker skin for him and and gave him an idea of like what the business is like um oh yeah. I, I i think that was probably the defining moment of his career because it was you know he was only a couple of years out of school at that point and yeah again i don't want to give it's too much toward, it's, it. it's earlier in the film yeah. but i don't want to give too much away yeah. but he makes a decision that if he had made the other decision and let his ego go and emotions rule the day we would never have heard of val kilmer probably not because no. of the people that he was you know and it's not even an antagonistic thing it was more you get the sense of i am skirting around stuff here folks yeah. but so uh but there as you mentioned sean uh sean penn and kevin bacon you get the feeling this was more of a production decision, not necessarily that there was animosity between the actors, right. but it was a decision of like, okay, what are you going to do with this now? Um, and I think that, yeah. yeah, that, that is, it's interesting to see this now because he wasn't anybody back then. No. So when you see Kevin Bacon, you know, Kilmer takes the, the mm. camera mm. into the dressing room and Kevin Bacon is like, wow, that's really is cool. Is that a video now. camera? Yeah, but he's like gives him this kind of thing. It's hard to read. Is that condescension or is he like in awe? Like, wow, I didn't think those things were that portable. Or but, why are you bringing that in here? <laughs> right. But you've got like Kevin Bacon is on top of the world in 1984 or five, whenever this was, mm -hmm. you know, and then Footloose and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. 
so he's the big shot. So is Sean Penn, mm -hmm. who's already an idol at that point. Then you got this guy, Val Kilmer, who's an up and coming actor, but he's still a nobody. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we think of it now like, oh my God, how could they disrespect Val Kilmer that way? It's like, who the hell is Val Kilmer back in 1984? Yeah. I mean, it, it just reminds you that everybody starts out somehow, somewhere, and it's what you do with, you know, where you're at at the time that can kind of lead into whatever opportunities come your way later, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love that that bit in the movie and I, I love those little parts of just you know seeing things that we're not used to seeing either backstage in a theater or behind camera uh, on a set a movie set from the uh perspective of, of the actor I mean the, the stuff that like when he's shooting on the set of Top Gun when he's shooting on a set of you know Dr. Moreau and notice he didn't have any footage from on a set of batman that would have been funny but even the stuff like <laughs> when he's in the trailer with kurt russell and tombstone I, I love that stuff that was fun well i don't think he could have taken any batman footage because he couldn't move <laughs> he that's couldn't true up the camera or... <laughs> <laughs> he needed a sidekick huh uh, but but um yeah the stuff with tombstone was pretty great um and just like some of the anecdotes that i didn't really know about like the whole you know Doc on his deathbed scene, what he had oh prepared for that. I didn't realize that. Um, well, kind of spoil the movie for you because, of course, he died, but you know, yeah. Right. But, you know, and I'd never seen that scene before. But mm -hmm. when you find out what Val Kilmer did to prepare for that scene, and then you get to see the scene play out, you're like, wow, that's what was going on. Yeah. You know, that's the trick. And it's, it's mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, yeah. 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 So, it's a great uh, doorway into an actor that we don't really know that much about. It's a great invitation to watch a bunch of these, you know, great and, you know, kind of mixed movies from a pretty incredible career. So I think that's, and that's all I've got to say. Do you have anything to wrap up Val before we talk about a, another movie that you're going to be talking about next or in, <sighs> on Monday? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I think that if I think, I have a feeling that this is for a specific audience, right? You know, people who know the actor or at least knew of the actor and it's going to be kind of within that there's going to be two branches of audiences, those who know what he's gone through and those who really haven't, you know, kept up to speed with what's happening in his life. So um, I think there's something for both camps um, in that sense. Um, and I, I do have to say that, um i did i did not meet val kilmer um at a convention but i did walk past him and this is be when he was doing the whole mark twain stuff oh um, we he, didn't he, even talk about the twain bit yeah yeah, yeah. yeah the twain stuff was amazing because he was touring with that for forever um and i didn't realize he sold his you know land for that role basically but um i it was at uh c2e2 one year and I think there was a rumor that, oh, Val Kilmer's here. Like, Whoa, really? I mean, that's, he's a huge star. Why would he be here? But, you know, I remember because I was working for the Hero Initiative, I would have like access to like behind the scenes type stuff. And I remember kind of cutting across behind some of the curtains and he was walking towards me with a, a couple of people, kind of a mini entourage. And he kind of looked like we kind of cut our eyes you know to get a little bit of a lock there and i was just like i don't want to i don't want to let him know that i know who he is and i'll just keep walking so it was it was pretty cool i'm like well kilmer is here and he was all right and he still looked good so <laughs> but yeah so i recommend val um yeah i think it's um I, I think like i said in the beginning i think it's a good gateway for the book which I'm, I'm definitely going to have to pick that up and, and check it out. Uh, you know, honestly, I've had a couple of nitpicks about the thing, you know, during our conversation. But honestly, this was one of the most moving and I think profound movies I've seen this year. I think for people who are interested in just the, just the life and the way that creative people think and view the world and the kind of struggles between following your creative passions to 
anywhere they'll lead to trying to have some semblance of a normal <laughs> family right. life and what that right. can do yeah. and the struggle to hang on and to see someone who actually hangs on and makes it work. How many mm-hmm. movies have we seen where it's the tragedy? Like, oh, he got into acting or painting or drugs and you know everything kind of fell apart. Yeah. yeah, there's, again, those valleys there, but there's an effort on the part of the person at the center of this movie to keep everything together and to try no matter how difficult things get, which I think is, is pretty inspiring. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah. I, I would have liked a little bit more of like, kind of like the, the nineties kiss, kiss, bang, bang type stuff. Um, but you know, he could only focus on so much. And I think there was, he was kind of, there was a whole, mo- a whole montage where they just like skimmed through all these other roles, like Wonderland and Red Planet and stuff. It's like, what, what, wait, hold on. Do you yeah. have anything to say about that? They, but- they can skip past Red Planet. <laughs> um, I want to talk about what you're doing this coming Monday, David. Take it uh, away. Yes. Well, um, finally, uh, we're, we'll see how it goes, but we are going back to an in-person after hours film society evening at the Tivoli Theater, the beautiful Tivoli Theater, historic Tivoli Theater in Downers Grove, Illinois. And uh, we're going to be showing uh, Edgar Wright's Sparks Brothers. I'll be introducing it and uh, discussing the movie with the audience, whoever wants to stay after. Um, And I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to do the whole film discussion thing with COVID and everything. And there was a whole while where I did kind of have Zoom discussions during kind of like the last year, Um, but we're now going back to in-person. As far as I know, nothing's canceled. So we're we're going going forward and they have a couple other films lined up, which uh, I'm excited about. Um, And uh, but this, uh, yeah, next Monday, the, the 16th is Sparks Brothers, so. We're looking awesome. forward to that. Well, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll leave the uh, the link and stuff for tickets down uh, in the description of this episode. So check that out. Thank you. Um, and yeah, that'll, that'll be cool. I haven't seen the Sparks Brothers, so uh, I will not be attending. But um, yes, I, I wish you luck. You'll have to catch up with it at some point. I will, because I didn't realize that was an Edgar Wright movie. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, he was a big fan of the band Sparks. Um, and he made this kind of like passion documentary about him and uh, a lot of other musicians and filmmakers and actors show up. So I haven't seen it yet, but I know about it and I like the trailer, what I saw. So looking forward to it. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, We'll be talking again very soon about things that have nothing to do well, with thing doing with comics yeah. DC Comics in particular. In fact, tonight when this airs, we're going to be talking about uh, What If on uh, Disney Plus, the new Marvel show. And then we're mm-hmm. going to be doing a live stream about The Suicide Duh. Squad. Yes. So what <laughs> the sequel is to slap on a the, the beginning of the title. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't get it. I don't know how. Why not just call it Suicide Squad 2? Mm. Or Suicide said squads because that's kind of oh never mind i don't want to give too much away spoiler (laughs) (laughs) but yeah so definitely uh if you're watching this in the morning on wednesday or whenever feel free to join us live here 8 30 p.m central time Uh, we're gonna be doing back-to-back live streams uh, with the with the rest of earth's mightiest critics so this is exciting but i'm excited to have talked about this movie with you thank you i think you maybe maybe suggested this to me and i'm Mm -hmm. i'm so glad you did because this might have slipped right past my radar uh thank you that was val you are david fowley of keeping it real because i keep forgetting to introduce people and uh yeah good night sir good night